I got or do you just Okay, so it's an honor to be here. Um, I figured since you guys were all going to be in uniform, I should be in uniform. I'm a reservist in the Navy, and I commissioned about uh, five and a half years ago, um, and I'm doing my residency just across the street. So hopefully, I run into you guys across the street from time to time. Um, I know the station. I know the C shift gentlemen more than I. I'm not sure if I've met any of you gentlemen. So I apologize. I don't know any of your names, but uh, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. Uh, so without further ado, talk about abdominal pain, and I, I agree. I think. It's a, abdominal pain can be a great mimicker of different conditions and um, I think sometimes, you know, it's easy to take it lightly when there can be something really bad going on in the abdomen. And um, as you guys know, there's uh, many things else, many things besides the stomach and the abdomen. So we'll do a quick anatomy review, talk about a few uh, things that will kill you fast, I'll talk a little bit about pregnancy and uh, we'll Actually, I, I do really do like your protocol handbook. Uh, so I went over, I tried to take a look through that and a little refresher. I'm sure many of you are more familiar with that than I am. So this is, a, I, I was a, here for a month as my daughter. She was pumped. She thought that I was a fireman for the whole month. <laughs> so just to zoom in, she, I think she got a hold of some yogurt. Yeah, she, uh, I think Devin, I can't remember who gave her the helmet, but she was pumped about it. Okay, so this is pretty, uh, I, I don't think I ever really think about the abdomen as nine quadrants, but here is just one way to break it down. You can see, I mean, you, you know, you guys are familiar with, uh, with the anatomy somewhat. Um, one thing I want to point out is that, in, you know, the right upper or left upper quadrant, the, obviously you have the lower chest wall, and, uh, you know, the spleen and the liver hide under the ribs up there, but also the lower lobes of the lungs. So pneumonia and acute coronary syndrome often mimic abdominal pain. Anyways, we'll talk about that more later, but here, here it is, four quadrants. So this is probably more um, referenced when you're giving a handoff to us or trying to describe something, whether it's the nursing staff or us. Uh, so the, I, this is not the most detailed di diagram, but you have left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant left lower quarter and then the epigastrium right in the middle so then let's not forget about big blue and big red so typically I mean and this is I mean, not typically but this is how it goes the you know IBC is on the right more to the right aorta is more on the left bad things can happen you know things that we worry about are more to do with big red on the left side of the abdomen but obviously it's not going to really you know, t you know, when you're examining a patient, you're not going to be able to, you know, tell which side's on. But and definitely, I'm not. You know, my, I'm sure, I think your examination skills are better than mine. Anyhow, and there's a couple. I, I like this diagram because then it includes. So there's the uh, peritoneum, and then there's a retroperitoneum. The peritoneum includes the grayed out. You know, of course, I grayed out the peritoneum here. Uh, you can see the colon and the small bowel. Hidden in here. Cool. And that's part of the peritoneum. Um, there's a peritoneal sheath that encompasses it, and then behind that is the retroperitoneum. And of course, I, I, didn't, I didn't put the kidneys here, but the kidneys would attach right here and here. These are the, this is the renal vein, renal arteries, um, and the retroperitoneum is interesting space. A lot of bad things can happen back there. A lot of spont, especially here in Sarasota, a lot of spontaneous bleeds, especially because so many people are on blood thinners. And that can contain a lot of blood. So sometimes, you know, it, it's it's almost as if it's a, you know, it's hidden behind a, a wall. You have, you have all these other things in front of it, and then in the back you have this is the iliopsoas here, these two muscles, and you can have large hematomas back there, and it can be spontaneous. So you know, it may, may not be a history of trauma. Anyway, just kind of an overview. Uh, here's another picture. I okay, here we go. I include the kidneys. So you got the kidneys. So things that are in the retroperitoneum are the kidneys, the aorta, the IVC, uh, the pancreas, the ureters. Things that are in the peritoneum are the stomach, the bowels, and some blood vessels and the gallbladder, the liver, uh, that sort of thing. So anyhow, here we go. So here are some of the C-shift guys. 
Do you know them too well? So I listed a couple of these catastrophes. These are these are really these can be really bad and um, kill people really fast. I've seen them a couple times. Uh, I haven't seen anybody die from ectopic yet, thank goodness. But GI bleeds, I definitely, I'm sure you guys have seen some bad GI bleeds. And then aortic dissection aneurysm. Uh, those people can be really sick. So I heard that yesterday there was a director that went out and said uh, ceasefire on the cold plunges. I was really sad about that. I heard about it. So. It's just for to keep morale under control. But I, I think I can see why. Not, no, I'm not complaining. I just I, I didn't mean to include this as a protest. I just. Uh, <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> I enjoyed them. It changed my life. I think the I think the benefits are really good. So, anyways, I, not not to protest. Just this is already part of the slideshow a month ago. So. <laughs> it's coincidental. Yeah, it's coincidental. Okay. So, uh, what, what do you guys think this is? What's this? It's a fire hose. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> so this is a view, this is called a, this is a, okay, really, t um, I didn't mean to do, it's a French word, and I didn't mean to, it just, this is called a DLFOI lesion. This kind of bleeder is a small artery in the stomach, and so the bleeding starts happening, and all of a sudden this person's vomiting up blood. Uh, and the, the really, you know, this is just an example, I, that's a dramatic picture of a GI bleed, but, um, you, know, the, you know, there's not much I can do for it in the ER. Um, and obviously it's hard for you guys to do anything about it in the field. But you know, once somebody comes in vomiting up blood, maybe they're unstable hemodynamically, they might be in septic shock. Uh, this needs def definitive treatment you know, in the endoscopic suite, but uh, I just wanted to include that. This, this can, and this is more common, it's difficult even in the endoscopic suite here. It's got, you know, since this is an endoscope, the guy's sedated, it's a nice clean environment, you know, there's no there's not a bunch of vodka bottle lying, lying around in the house, but um, even then it's hard to see this uh, with a nice video camera in this nice clean AC environment. But um, honestly, some of the worst GI bleeds that I've, I've seen are, are variceal bleeds where the um, upper esophagus has lots of dilated veins. Essentially, if you look at you know, the varices that are down, you see the legs that are full of dilated veins. The same thing is on the esophagus. And usually that occurs in alcoholics, people that are just chronically ill. Um, you know, risk factors are, you know, the elderly. I would think pretty much generally if you have somebody who is having a big bleed from their mouth and they're, you show up, you know, you get that, the sick person call, you get there, there's like 10 whiskey bottles around them and they're, they're vomiting, you know, you have to think about, uh, Varices or a G, you know, gastritis, gastropathy, turning into a bad ulcer, turning into a bad bleed. So it can be really, and as you guys know, it can smell really bad if they're presenting with lots of stool. And uh, you know, you're thinking, oh man, now after this, I'm gonna have to clean up the back of the engine, the rescue, and it's gonna be a big, you know, the, the young, you know, I guess the junior, the junior guy on the team is probably thinking, oh gosh, now I have to think of clean up the back of the uh, rescue. And, that's for EMTs. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so, anyways, G, that's GI bleeds. Uh, do you guys have any questions about that? Any experience you guys have had with uh, GI bleeds that are... Yeah. Or you've... Yeah. You've... Uh, what's, what's the worst one you've seen? Like you said, just really bad. <clears throat> lots of lots of blood. Like, there's alcohol bottles around. It's esophageal varices. And uh, a lot of times, a few of them, they just... They, de they decompensate really quickly, even on the way to the hospital. Exactly. So, so you're just saying, so just to yeah, repeat the question, yeah. You see Say that again? You can smell it before you even see them. How bad, you know what I mean? Yeah, you can smell it before you can see them. That's exactly right. Now you can walk by, you know, if, if I'm in the ER, I can walk by a room and I think, oh gosh, that's a bad GI bleed right there. I can, I, I agree. And I think just to repeat what you're saying, uh, they can decompensate really quickly with all that blood in their mouth. And as you guys know, you know, the ABCs, that's where suction comes in really uh, handy and it's very important. So anyhow, uh, I just want to, you know, once, once upon a time I was a firefighter for a little while. I, uh, this is at, during officer development school uh, at the Newport Naval Command. I, it was a good time. I mean, I, I think, you know, I've probably forgotten. I, my skills were very... Uh, I wouldn't say they were very meaningful. It was a lot of fun. 
doing structure fires, uh, it was we did our training in a, a six-story metal building, and I, you know, it's. I think I never sweated so much in my life. I didn't realize how much gear you guys wear until that, you know, that that tr that training period, and I, I think I sweat ten gallons of water, at least. I mean, ten gallons in a day, maybe every week. It's crazy. So, anyways, uh, you guys do carry a lot of gear. Thank you for what you do, and I hope that if uh, my house ever catches on fire, that you guys get there quick. So, I don't know if you guys can see me. I'm over in the back on the uh, on the right. Okay, so do you guys know what this is? What is this? Any any guesses? Ulcer. Well, actually, it's not a bad guess. It's a it's an ulcer of of a big organ in the retroperitoneum. The retroperitoneum, I know, is a fancy word. Yeah, but... yeah exactly. It's a AAA. Yeah, so that's a AAA, and it is an ulcer, ulcerated plaque. Um, you know, people that have this, this is not something that just happens overnight, as you guys probably can see. This doesn't happen overnight. It happens over many years. The the risk factors for this, I mean. You guys will get there. You're going to get the call, and you may even feel, you may see the person. Line, you know, they may be lined out. I don't know. Sometimes the classic triad, the three things that go on are hypotension, abdominal pain, and the third can be syncope. So if somebody syncopizes, you take their blood pressure really low. You know, you might not. It, it's rare, but I have seen where you see a large pulsating mass in their abdomen, and you can feel it. And it's just, you know, it's like a giant. Can be football, honestly. This is probably a this is probably a ten centimeter annular, so this is pretty big. But um, I have seen I have seen people with very large aneurysms. So you will probably I'm sure some of you have seen it, and if you haven't, then you probably will. But and this is obviously a nice pathology image. You know, you just have the aorta. Obviously, you know, I think the person did pretty well without their aorta. I'm just kidding. But so this person obviously did not make it. So. I said, I said syncope, but I think uh, so abdominal pain, obviously, so hypertension, abdominal mass, syncope, abdominal pain. So, uh, but everybody, you know, everybody who has ever smoked should, and this is just kind of good to know, your friends or family, everybody who's ever smoked should have a screening abdominal ultrasound by the age of 65, or start, I'm sorry, starting after age 65. So, if you have family members or if you have smoked in the past, it would be worthwhile to do this. So, just so everybody knows. Any questions about that? Okay, so anybody know what this, this, what does this diagram represent? So, what was that? Is that a turkey <laughs> So this is a, uh, this is the top of the aorta. It looks kind of, it looks, it's a kind of a, a weird diagram. So this is the top of the aorta coming down into the heart. So right here, this is the aortic valve. It's kind of like the heart is you know grayed out here, but this is usually the chest. I took a picture of the chest, but uh, the aorta obviously goes down, you know, the abdomen, like we we're talking about a minute ago. And essentially, what's going on here? There are different. There's three different layers of every blood vessel, and it goes for the aorta, the biggest, like the you know the ones that are about this big. So the there's you know as you can see here there's. There's fancy Latin words. There's the intima, the media, adventitia. So obviously this is kind of like, I, I, want, I want to keep the, th you know, the thousand foot view, but essentially those three flaps can separate and then blood dissects along the plane and it can cause really bad pain. Uh, it can cause, and, you know, the, it's, this, is what's, this is a diagram of aortic dissection. Um, you know, classically it's described as ripping, tearing pain to the back. Um, you know, it can mimic pancreatitis. Pancreatitis can mimic this. You know, anything bad in the abdomen can rate it to the back of the chest. And so one thing that you guys, it may be helpful just in terms of your, your diagnostic skills and, you know, even it goes for me too, is that anything that radiates, if things rate, if something from the abdomen is rated to the back, you should think about bad things in the retroperitoneal space. The aorta, the kidneys, and the pancreas. Those are three things that can cause really bad pain to the back. So kidney, I mean, kidney stones, I wouldn't say that's necessarily like an abdominal catastrophe, but it, you know, those can be pretty bad, but uh, all those three things can radiate to the back. So if something's radiated to the back, think about things like this. 
or pancreatitis. I'll talk about the other. So, um, and you know, one of the things that I want to briefly mention, you guys really rely on your hands and I love it. So I, I wish I rely, I should probably, you guys have better you know, palpation skills, I'm sure, than I do. And um, you also have your, you know, your manual blood pressure cuff. You have the automatic cuff, obviously. But if you have a widened pulse pressure, like if the patient has a blood pressure of 180 over 40 and they're having bad back pain and abdominal pain, they look really sick and, you know, they're not using, you know, they're, hopefully they're not intoxicated, hopefully they're not using marijuana. Mar marijuana can mimic this. I think marijuana, vomiting due to marijuana can unfortunately mimic this kind of uh, situation. I, I, it's, uh, you know, you think the person's having a dissection because there's so much pain because they're vomiting, but anyhow, there's a lot of things going on. But, but you have a widened pulse pressure, meaning systolic and diastolic pressure is, you know, you have 100 millimeters of mercury between those two and you have bad abdominal pain. You could think about this. So widened pulse pressure. And uh, then if you have, you know, if you're, if you're having a lot of time on the transplant, then you have a lot of time in the back of the, the rescue. But if you have some time and you're, you're wondering about this, you can check the blood pressure readings of different limbs because there's, you know, obviously you have different, you have the three, there's three blood vessels that come off the aorta like this. There's one that goes, you know, one goes to the right side of the head, left side of the head, and then there's a subclavian. The subclavian goes on the arm, obviously. Um, sorry, not obviously, but that's what it does. So if you have a dissection after the takeoff of the subclavian, you may have a high blood pressure reading in your arm and a low blood pressure reading in your leg because that dissection is getting good blood flow to the arm and not to the leg. So one way to kind of, you know, if you, and if you have a neurologic deficit or somebody can't move their, their leg, maybe because it's not getting blood flow, that's a bad sign and also can make this more likely. So, I don't know, is that helpful at all? I, I hope that's a little bit enlightening, but, so if you have a wide pulse pressure, if you have asymmetric blood pressure readings in the arms and legs, if you have the time, not that you always have the time in the back of the rescue, but, and it's, and it's a tough space back there, but. Anyhow, just some things that hopefully I think about too, you know, in the ER. So, you can come in and say, hey, Dr. Lane, can you, uh, you maybe check the blood pressure readings in the limbs and the arms and make sure that they're, it's not too much of a discrepancy. Maybe this guy's a dissection. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to ask you, um, now that we have gone over some of the signs and symptoms to look at, other than rapidly getting them to the hospital, which is there anything we would want to do? Or like normally you treat hypotension with fluids or vasopressors. Yeah. Like would that be a contraindication when you know this person's literally bleeding out one of yeah. the largest vessels? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in the ER, uh, what we do is we start ESMOL. Okay. So I think this is probably where you might, you know, somebody is, somebody might be, in this case, uh, you know, I t these are kind of all nicely like sorted out pathologies. I, I, I did this first, I, I'm gonna talk about more interventions later on and I, maybe I'm gonna spend too much time on this, but the, I, that's a really good question. Like do, is there anything that you can do when somebody is dissecting in the rescue or you know, in the, when, in the, when you get there with the engine. This person may be coding, and obviously the first thing to do there is to follow your ACLS protocol. In fact, if the dissection is, if the dissection is into the, you know, right near the aortic valve and dissecting the coronary arteries, they will be coding. So this is a, this is a great question, and that will be, uh, possibly the presentation. If not, they may have a little bit of time, like if they're dissecting into the planes, they may have this bad pain and eventually will bleed out. But right now, they may be, they may, you may have some time. So essentially, I think, you know, following the ACLS protocol is essentially what you need to do. I don't think there's a protocol in the handbook for, you know, for severe hypertension. I, I, is there actually, I, I didn't see one, but. We don't currently treat hypertension. Which makes sense. It's a but it's not. This was, I think, I think they were trying to do a chiropractic adjustment here. I, I, there's a, <laughs> I think that was what was going on. I came into the kitchen and, Chuck. yeah, Chuck and uh, Matt, yeah, it's Chuck, yeah. So he was like, hey, Matt, come here. I want to show you how, you know, I, I need to do some maneuver. So he, uh, and he, he was popping uh, Matt Russell's spine. 
Okay, so these are a little bit more, I, I'm not sure I would, I've never diagnosed this clinically and it's hard to diagnose even with a CAT scan. So, but this can be really bad. This can be a really bad pain. Clues to this diagnosis, mesenteric ischemia is essentially ischemia of the mesentery. The mesentery covers the small bowel, it's like a sheet, and um, it, you know, the mesentery contains a bunch of blood vessels. I'll just say that if somebody has, you know, this is another thing to think about if you, you know, if you have the time or energy in the back to rescue it. You know, mesenteric ischemia, if somebody has a history of AFib, they're not on blood thinners, not anticoagulation, and this can, this would be something that I should be thinking about, maybe you guys should be thinking about too. Um, it's not a, a lot that, you know, to do about it out in the field, but if it's diagnosed in the ER, we start heparin. And honestly, this is where if somebody's, you know, somebody can present in shock, they can, they uh, will have pain out of proportion. Pain out of proportion mean you, they're complaining, they're sitting there writhing in pain. It's almost a little like kidney, the kidney stone pain, where they're sitting writhing in pain, but you, you, you know, you tap in their belly, you know, or you, and they're not really having a lot of pain, you know, you palpate the abdomen, they're not having a ton of pain, but they're complaining of severe pain. So, just a tip, that might, uh, that might be the, uh, that might be the diagnosis. And this is what the bowel looks like. I, just, I include some pictures because I'm all about pictures. Uh, so this is this is dead bowel right here. And so obviously, um, you know, I know this is. I think, uh, you know, Devin Bell did this in the back of the rescue. He just opened up his little operating kit, <laughs> <laughs> took out the bowel, and this is uh, his diagnosis. So you know, anyway, so this can obviously be it in the OR and in a nice air conditioned environment. Another thing it can cause really bad belly pain, pancreatitis. So this may be, you might see this more often than other other things that I've talked about so far. You know, if you have a history of, if the person has a history of heavy alcohol use, you show up, there's five handles of vodka sitting in the room and they're having bad belly pain. You know, this could be, you know, alcohol I think is the most common cause of pancreatitis, heavy alcohol use. So pancreas releases enzymes, so those enzymes get overtaxed, you get, pancreatitis and it's a kind of a it's kind of a cyclic you know it's cyclical and the you know, the enzymes are digesting the area around the pancreas and even parts of the pancreas it can cause you know if you have pancreas pancreatitis enough times you can get a big abscess you can get a pseudocyst you can get a big cyst near the pancreas like I said earlier this is in the that back space the retroperitoneum so if you have belly pain maybe around the um, the umbilicus radiates to the back. You should think about pancreatitis. Uh, you know, fluids. I think I'm going to talk about interventions in a minute, but uh, you know, pretty much this person is probably going to be a lot of pain. Most of these people are in a lot of pain, so we'll talk about the the pain pain protocol that is uh, in the handbook in a little bit. So this is what you might see on exam. So you might see this is called <clears throat> uh, Gray Turner sign. So you have bruising on the flank. It can be kind of dramatic, but you may, I've seen it before, I think I'm sure Dr. Frank's seen it before, um, and it's uh, essentially losing from the, it's, it's blood, you know, in the retroperitoneum. it's not necessarily a ton of blood back there, but a little bit of blood can cause some bruising on the flanks, and this is classically associated with pancreatitis, so not always, but, and also, I mean, a, a, a triple A can also, you know, could cause this, a bleeding triple A could cause this sort of, uh, yeah, any, presentation. any hemorrhage in the retroperitoneum. Yeah, right. So like a, uh, like a psoas hematoma, like you talked about those, those could even go back. So let's go back to that picture. Actually. So anything back, so if you have a bleeding aorta, if you have a big retroperitoneal hematoma, you know, I, I, you know less common iliacus uh, hematoma, but uh, iliopsoas hematoma can cause the same kind of uh, bruising pattern. And I don't have the pancreas here, but let's see if the pancreas is, anyway, so go back to the, and this is called Cullen sign. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen this as much. I've seen the other bruising pattern more commonly, but this is a classic associated with pancreatitis as well. Any questions about this so far? Okay. So then, of course, you know, bowel perforation can present with a lot of pain. You may get a call for this as well. Uh, but there are lots of causes. You know, probably one of the more common reasons you guys will see this in the field is for after trauma. You know, a, a bad MVC. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have picked up people for, you know, bad diverticulitis, appendicitis before as well. Um, but this kind of pain, 
you know, I, I didn't have a slide on appendicitis and diverticulitis. Those are, those are both problems of the bowel. Um, diverticulitis is usually of the large bowel, outpouchings of the colon that get infected with bacteria. Like a little, essentially, they can, they can be asymptomatic for a while, but once bacteria get in there, they, you know, it's called diverticulosis. Once bacteria get in there and they start making a little, they have a little party in those pouches of the, in the colon, it can be, you know, causes diverticulitis. And once that party gets too bad or too big, then the pouch can perforate, and then you have a perforated bowel, and then you have really bad pain. It can present as, it can present as, uh, you know, high, basically hypertensive. They can look very, they can look shocky. Um, you know, you you palpate the abdomen or you tap it and they have peritoneal signs meaning that you just tap it lightly and that anytime you even just shake the not, you know, anything that causes the, the peritoneal sheath to get irritated such as going over a bump in the road the patient will have you know maybe jump off the table in pain or, or act like they're going to jump off the table in pain um, appendicitis so appendicitis is the uh, is an effect is an infection of the appendix so it's at the very end of is it right at the beginning of I guess it's a, in the cecum so it's right at the right where the small bowel transitions to the large bowel. Um, you can go and I'm sure you may, maybe some of you gentlemen have had appendicitis before but it can be pretty painful they can also present as septic shock but uh, I think a lot of times people you know go by POV to the ER for that. I include this uh, kind of more for completeness sake Cholangitis. So this is an infection of the acute cholangitis is an infection of the biliary tract. So that you know that classically cholangitis, these people, you know, probably have comorbidities. It's caused by translocation. You know, fancy word. Basically, you know, the small the bowel and the and the parts of the biliary tract include the the gallbladder, the tubes and vessels coming off the gallbladder to connect it to the small bowel because the and I, I can go back to the picture in a minute but essentially this is uh, a pretty can be a pretty bad infection easy to manage surgically like many of the other things but you'll have fever sometimes but m you know most of the time right upper quadrant pain and they may be jaundiced they may be hypotensive and they may have neurologic it may be altered it may you know, classically, there's a pentad. It's called Reynolds pentad, but you know that's not something that that need, needs to be known necessarily. But that it's classically there's a Reynolds pentad and includes those five things. So, it may be altered. They may have a fever. They may be jaundice. They have right quarter pain. So, and you know these people may have a history of gallstones. And if you're picking them up, they probably are presenting pretty sick. I'm guessing. So, okay, so really quickly. I guess this goes for anything, any catastrophe. People die from too much bleeding and too little breathing. And you guys are really good at handling that and being the first ones to do it. Hopefully this helps a little bit, but um, so this is, you know, after the you know, a young lady was taken to OR, this is ectopic period. This is a little it's a little baby in there you can see. Um, but uh, it's a gestational sac. But I, I've seen this before, you know. If you have a young lady that is having belly pain, I think it should be, that's the first thing that I need to be thinking about in the ER. Young lady, you know, female of childbearing age, abdominal pain, we need to make sure that they're not pregnant and not having an ectopic pregnancy. So once they start bleeding, this is because the uterus and ovaries, that area is very well supplied by blood. And so if there is anything that's ruptured, um, that can be, that can, like we've talked about before, can decompensate really, you can, the patient can decompensate very quickly and die. So uh, anyhow, any questions about ectopic pregnancy? I didn't really have a, a detailed slide on it, but just to uh, give you an idea. So may you, the patient may present hypotensive. You may see that the abdomen is descended from a, you know, from, you may be able to see clinically that the patient is pregnant, but oftentimes this small, you're not gonna be able to tell if the patient's pregnant just by looking at them, but you gotta think about it. And you know, you guys, I'm sure sending you transported uh, either babies that are trying to come out or are stuck or are about to come out. So this is a catastrophe, you know, necessarily, I just want to include it. I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, abdominal pain, but if the baby is stuck there, I wanted to, to at least talk about things you guys can do. Um, it, you know, I, I guess the first thing is, to, you know, you need to expedite transport. Um, 
and depending on, I guess, where you find it, if the baby's in the home or in the vehicle, um, you, what you want to do is, and actually, I don't know if you guys have a protocol. You probably don't have, maybe don't have a protocol for this, but, you know, you get some sterile gloves on, and this is a classic example of shoulder dystocia, where the shoulder gets stuck behind the pubic bone. So, the first maneuver, there's a bunch, there's a series of maneuvers to do, but the first maneuver is to apply, I would apply pressure over the pubic bone, just to, just above, and you're going to feel like just feel the maybe the top of the or the maybe the mid portion of the uterus and apply pressure there. If the mom's wanting to push, obviously you want to tell the mom not to push. You know, if you're you know far away from the hospital, I probably would advise not pushing until you get to the hospital. But if there's if the baby is you know dying or it you know, looks like the baby's pretty pretty sick, then I, I would. And if the mom's really trying, like just not listening to you, is pushing, then apply pressure above the pubic bone. That may release the shoulder dystocia and allow the baby to come out. Any questions about that? I just want to include that really quick. Oh, we did a we did a training with maybe uh, a lot ago now, two years ago or so, shoulder dystocia. So you guys did a training a little while ago on shoulder dystocia. I, uh, I I've seen it a couple times. Actually, I've helped. You know, with this shoulder dystocia a couple times, I've been on my OB rotations, but it can be pretty dramatic. Okay, so. I see any kind of abdominal trauma can cause bad belly pain. I think I talked about, you know, perf perforated bowel. It's probably going to be the biggest thing when you have a, a bad trauma. But then abdominal pain doesn't always mean anything, something bad is going on in the abdomen. That's just something good to remember. And these are some situations where I, where I ended up doing, you know, where I ended up being part of or doing CPR or, you know, if you have tr abdominal trauma with heavy machinery, I think I had a gentleman who was stuck between a forklift and the wall. He came to the ER, he's having bad belly pain. It happened six hours prior. I think five minutes after I spoke with him, he went into cardiac arrest. I, I, I never found out why. I, he was in the ICU for weeks. I think we coded him for about um, at least a half an hour before he got Ross. But it was a it was a V-fib arrest and then PA. So I don't I don't know exactly what caused it, but obviously any kind of you know any any, any gunshot wound has a potential in the thorax or even abdomen has, has the potential to cause arrest. Um, and then obviously pedestrians or cyclists versus an automobile can lead to bad outcomes. All right, so these are some of the mimickers. Pneumonia can, that those lower lobes in the, in the thorax can cause belly pain. Um, and then an MI can mimic belly pain. So you guys, and I know that, I think the protocol, you guys have anything between the umbilicus to the neck, you're supposed to do a 12 lead EKG, I think, which makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, it's uh, definitely have had people in the ER who have a lot of belly pain and either have an end STEMI or a STEMI. So, okay, so here we'll talk about some interventions. So, you know, you guys do this in every patient. You vitals, blood glucose, start an IV. I, I think, I know sometimes there's a, at least, well, let's say it's, uh, sometimes I feel like there's maybe a hesitancy. Do I do start an IV? Do I not? I think for most cases of a of belly pain, it's pretty reasonable to start an IV if they are having a lot of pain. And then I think the protocol, so you could do the so pain between the nose and the umbilicus, 12 EKG. And then I didn't know this, but I guess you guys are supposed to do a serial EKG every 10 minutes. If you do one and the transport's longer than 10 minutes, you're supposed to do another one. That's part of the protocol. I don't know how often I, I ever, I'm not sure. I probably can count on my hands how many times I've gotten, and I should, this is probably not good, but how many times I've gotten serial EKGs 10 minutes apart. So you guys are really good at doing that. I, I think it'll, it'll, you know, it's easy for time to pass by. It's like 50 minutes, oh shoot, this person's having chest pain or abdominal pain. I've, I've only got, you know, I'm not sure. I, I rarely get two EKGs on people with belly pain, but it seems like a, it seems like a really good thing. So this is where Steve and our Frank revived me with some coffee the other day. Uh, I think I, I think I had, uh, I think I wasn't responsive in the back of the vehicle, and Steve felt necessary to revive me. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is after that day at the uh, sandwich shop. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I think I had a foot long, and I, I wasn't able to handle it very well. 
So I can't remember what we were responding to, but it was pretty hot outside and uh, bright. Okay, so interventions. I was going to ask you, just skip right to the inner osseous line. Where do we put in IO? If, you are, if you're having difficulty putting in a line, where are the places we put it in IO? So, humeral head. What part, what part of the humeral head? So, is there a way you guys have to palpate, like figure out where to do it? So, I guess you just put your thumb, and you kind of, usually I internally rotate the arm, and you get a good exposure of the, of the humeral head, and I think honestly, either side, I think. You think when I've done it before, I've just done it right kind of on the anterior portion of the humeral head. How about what are the other places? So the humeral head, where's the second place? What was that? The distal femur for children. D distal yeah. femur for children. And then how about for adults? Where, what part of the lower extremity would you put the IO line? Tibial tuberosity. Tibial tuberosity. So yeah, two, so classically it's two, I think two inches below, or two fingers below the tuber tuberosity and two inches lateral to the anterior tibia. So two and two. And then where's the third place you can do it? Or a third place you can do it? Sternum. Sternum. Have any of you guys ever tried that on yourself? Not for yourself. <laughs> Probably not a good idea, but I, 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 know, I have some friends that have done it. And that's pretty painful. So, so sternum, I guess, is the, I guess the last go to. So humeral head, tibial tuberosity, two fingers, lateral two fingers, distal, and then the sternum. The sternum. And then for children, Distal femur. So let's see, pain control, nausea control, IV fluids. I, I think I wanted to talk about this, but I think you know, if somebody's hypotensive, you, you fall, there's a probably another protocol in the handbook is to if somebody's hypotensive, you start fluids. Um, you know, mostly people probably can use a 500 cc bolus. I, I think you have paramedic discretion, but obviously they're hypotensive, you need to start fluids. And then pain control, nausea control. Nausea control, especially if somebody's vomiting. I mean, if you have a GI bleeder, you know, I think they can be really helpful. Um, you know, just get that line in there, get the, get that Zofran in there and, and help control their symptoms. And this is just, this is the protocol. I, I, I really do like the handbook you guys have. Um, just a quick refresher. So I guess a maximum of three doses of Dilaudid, and that goes for the fentanyl as well, but, and I, I know Dr. Frank included, you have large frame, medium frame, small frame people, but um, sometimes I feel like you guys are better at controlling pain in the rescue than I, I, mean, I, than I am in the ER. I'll, I'll, I, I need to get better at reassessing them more frequently, but I think you guys are really good at controlling their pain. That's my, my humble opinion, or not so humble opinion. Any questions about this? Yes, sir. So in years past, they, there was some discussion about like with abdominal pains no, I think a lot of patients are concerned about that. Um, I'm going to let Dr. Frank answer that question. What do you think about that, that question, Dr. Frank? I, answer the question. Okay, all right. I, um, no, don't ever be afraid. To, it's not. There's not. A, that's not a thing. Honestly, it's like uh, we're going to ask them if they're in pain. We're going to treat their pain, and most likely, if they're having a lot of belly pain, or did, or depending on their other, you know, different. It's a lot of refractors, but most of the time we're going to get a CT scan. Most of the time. And, you know, 100 micrograms of fentanyl, half a milligram of Dilaudid, or one milligram of Dilaudid won't, won't mask that pain enough for us to, I think, really change the patient's care. I think it's better care to treat their pain. I mean, that's why we're here. Treat their, you know, make sure that they have less pain. And they may be able to re relate. One thing I want to point out is one, they may be able to relate a better history if they're in less pain. So that is another uh, reason. To, and then, you know, I think if somebody does have a, a, you know, a perforated bowel, an acute abdomen, then the, you know, they're still going to have a lot of pain even if you give them one milligram of Dilaudid. That's different. So I, and I really like the, pro, I like the pain protocol. I think oftentimes I don't treat pain as well as you guys do in Back to the Rescue. So I can learn from this. You know, this is a good, I, you know, I think it's, uh, Sometimes I think I'm, I, I feel like sometimes I'm worried to treat their pain in the ER. Maybe sometimes for the same reason, but I shouldn't be. So, nice. Any other questions about that? All right. All right. So this is something brief I want to talk about in the pro, you know in the in the fire department protocol that Dr. Frank has. 
there's you know guidelines. You guys have when to go red lights and sirens, when to expedite transport. Um, obviously, the patient is unstable vitals that are hypotensive. Um, if the patient is, and this is something that you know, this goes without saying, you guys already know this. Um, I'm just talk, preaching the choir here, but if they're bleeding out of their mouth, I'd say even if they had a, you know, even if they had kind of a benign looking like a, you know, they vomited twice, a little bit of black. That can change really quickly. If they had two, they vomited a couple times, a little bit of coffee ground emesis, and they're they're sick looking. You guys, I would I would try to get them. You know, I know there's always risk going red lights and sirens, but that can change really quickly. They can, they can, they can code really quickly. So I would, you know, and I know that if you guys if they're coding at home, you work them on the scene, but they code in the back of the rescue. Or I think even in the ER, the quick, quicker you can get people that are bleeding from their mouth, you know, ble having any kind of GI bleeding, rectum, mouth, I think that's. Uh, obviously, it's a paramedic discretion at the at the end of the day. But any questions about that? Any anything that? Yeah, I I thought that was a. I was just thinking about this when I was preparing the lecture, and I think that I know it's risky to go you know red light red lights and sirens, but certain things like a GI bleed can go south really quick, especially if it's a variceal bleed. I mean, that's because I've seen a couple bad ones recently. But and these are some of the just more details. Um, these are part of the protocol, like the fire department protocol. Just to refresh. So, and I guess, do you guys try to, I was, I was going to ask, everybody, you guys throw everybody on end title back in, in the back of the rescue, is that, is everybody, most people get thrown in end title? Is it kind of a, what was it? Mostly respiratory. Respiratory, but not so much if they're having abdominal pain. I, guess it, I mean, it kind of makes sense. I, uh, I guess a lot of things that, if somebody is, you know, looking sick, it's. I think you should throw. I think. I think this is good. You know, I follow your protocol. Throw everybody an end title if they're having bad belly pain, and you know, it could be there could be a lot of things causing the belly pain. Obviously, we just talked about it, but it's an, it's another. You know, if they're if they're not breathing super well, it's you know, it's another way to clinically look you know look at them. So. Just going some of the details. And I wanted to talk briefly about a, about a, uh, a case I had recently. Okay, so this is part of this is part of the training I went through in Newport, and, and this is I know this is uh, like water and fire rescue training. I I think the. Uh, I, I mean, I learned a lot that that month. I thought it was pretty fun, um, but this is we. They did this uh, one training for us where we, they stuck us in a, it's a it's a basically a model ship in a in a giant building, and they they rock the ship back and forth, and then they start pumping water into it. And I think the highest water gets is up to your neck, and then they start um, banging on the walls, and and essentially you're supposed to figure out how to get out of these uh, flooding rooms. Um, this is me trying to, I can't remember what I was doing here, but I, somebody got a picture of me holding a log, and I just thought it was cool, so I want to show you. Okay, so here's a case. So this was, I think this happened about a month ago. I, we got a call, or I, you know, I, I heard that EMS got called for back pain. Uh, the report we got from the paramedic was they, the patient had abdominal pain and back pain. And then I found out that I think the blood sugar was, the patient had a blood glucose of 10. So these are the vitals. So something that jumps out immediately, you have this, what's this right there? No. Austin saturation 80%, that's pretty bad. So complaining of back pain and abdominal pain, what are you guys thinking? Let's just name three things. Aortic aneurysm. Aortic aneurysm. So we can talk about, I wanna talk about the difference between aortic dissection and aneurysm in a minute. So yeah, maybe something going with the aorta. What else? Pneumonia. Pneumonia, yeah? What's the third thing? Something we don't want to miss. What was what, part of the protocol? Any any pain between the umbilicus and the oh, stemmy? Stemmy. I think the nose and the umbilicus. Yeah, stemmy. So any of those three things. So something bad in the aorta, something bad in the lungs, something bad in the bowels, or the heart, I should say. So then they tell us that they that she had a blood sugar of ten. They gave. I think one of you guys gave her uh, some glucagon, and she didn't have IV. It was—I mean, she did look like she was clamped down. She was, she was, you know, somewhat. 
She was very sick looking. She had, uh, she was pretty pale. And then this is, I, I think our initial vital signs, she was hypertensive, tachycardic, and an oxygen saturation of 76% when we got a good pleth. So they were telling us, like, we didn't get a good pleth. Like, I'm not sure, you know, she's pretty cold, couldn't get a good IV. Those are all bad signs. Anyhow, you guys have seen plenty of, of, of sick people, but uh, she was almost a ton, like, now that I'm thinking about it, when I first saw her, she's almost just completely out of it. Um, she was able to tell, tell us her name, able to tell us that she was having a really bad back pain and belly pain. Um, so we, I think we talked about, you know, that this could be something going bad with the aorta. You know, I, that just that combination of abdominal pain, obtundation, and back pain, that just is a really, that's a really bad combination. So I think we're talking about with an abdominal dissection or aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm. An aortic aneurysm is kind of a slow process. It can happen over years, and all of a sudden it can rupture in the belly. It's not really, uh, the dissection is, is, I just want to talk about the difference really quick. Dissection is between two planes, so there's three layers in every blood vessel. There's the intima, the media, and the adventitia. The adventitia is the outermost, the media is the middle, and the intima is the most intimate part, the innermost part of the blood vessel. And the dissection usually happens between the intima and the media, those two planes. And the blood is usually contained, and it will dissect up and down the aorta. It will be contained. If that ruptures, then that's different. But usually, it's contained, and it can also dissect up into the, you know, up into the coronary arteries. I was talking about that hook. I'll show that picture one more time. That's for you guys who got here a little bit later. Just talk about this. Really. I just want to get the, the difference down. So this is a dissection. So this up here. Let's see if I have the. Can you guys see the mouse? Yeah. Kind of. Oh, yeah. So this, if the dissection is up here, it can dissect and cause a stem into the coronary arteries because the coronary arteries come off this area in the aorta. These are the aortic valves, and the coronary arteries actually sit in these two cusps. Or these, I, there's two up there. There are three, usually, um, most of the time. But this dissection, as you can see, it's contained inside the walls of the blood vessel. An aneurysm, it, it's like a slowly, it's a, it's a similar but not the same. It's a, it's a, you know, it's almost like a balloon expanding until it pops. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so in this patient, I actually probably wouldn't be thinking about um, abdominal aneurysm as much. I'd be thinking maybe, maybe dissection, maybe, but uh, she wasn't, she was hypertensive, not hypotensive. If it's a leaking aneurysm, you'll be hypotensive. So, any questions about that? Okay, so this is what, uh, this is not a picture of the patient, but this is what the patient looked like. So that, I mean, what would you guys think, what would you guys say about this picture? Like, sick, healthy, sick, right? So, I mean, that, that kind of model look is never good, I, and especially they're cold, and I, I do think that, I mean, you probably are thinking when you see that, like, if I have to get an IV on that patient, it's probably going to be hard, it's probably going to be kind of clammy. So, yeah, the, it was hard to get an IV. So our accu check was 26. So she was. So we gave her some. So I. I, I think I, I. put. I actually ended up putting the IV in just with an ultrasound. It really quick. I think I put. That was the first thing I did after doing our primary survey. Get throwing her on oxygen. She was on a non rebreather, and then um, this was the EKG. What do you guys say about that EKG? Yeah, so something going on, you said something going on in the inferior leads. Maybe, I guess I'm thinking more, it's a couple of things. It's not necessarily, I think there's a, well, there's, I guess there's an, a couple of things that worry me. This worries me a little bit. And then this little deflection, there's actually a fancy name for this, but it's called a, so there's two things. This looks like a STEMI pattern to me. And also this could be, the little deflection, this is just something I want to bring up. It can be a sign of hypothermia, that deflection at the, uh, what was it? Osborne wave. Yeah, Osborne, exactly, yeah, there you go, nice. I should have asked, is it, what is that called? But nice work. That's an Osborne wave. So, that EKG is a little more clear. The one that we had, I, 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 that was another patient. 
to EKG. She also had osmoids. I wasn't able to get a whole, I, I didn't, I got somebody else's EKG because I wanted it a little more clear, but the, the one that she had, they're, they're questionable. I think she had a left bundle branch block and there was, um, it was basically, it, I think it met STEMI criteria. So we called the cardiologist about this, but at this point, um, there was right, right at that same time, she started kept desatting and you know, with the non rebreather, her, she was altered, so we can't, you know, if somebody's altered, we have the non rebreather on, what's the next step? Two. Yeah, two, exactly. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do BiPAP? Why can't we do CPAP? They're altered. They're altered, exactly. They can't follow commands. They're gonna be pulling the thing off their face. So she kept declining. So this, we gave her some, you know, I got, the, I, we, so I was getting the IV and gave her some oral gel. That probably was not a good idea. She may have been choked, who knows? I, maybe I caused her to choke on the oral gel, not a good thing. Um, but we gave her, you know, dextrose, lactate ringers, and then we intubated her. And then 10 minutes after we intubated her, um, then she coded. And we did actually talk to the cardiologist. The cardiologist said, well, you know, she's too unstable right now. Stabilize her, and then we think about the cath lab. So, um, it was, you know, she, um, as you guys can see, she was very sick. So we did, you know, the, the initial rhythm was VTAC. We gave her the whole kit and caboodle. One thing, we, did not, we didn't give her esmolol because of the hypotension. Um, she did get multiple shocks. We did get ROSC after about 20 minutes here. Uh, and then I get another call 30 minutes later. You know, I'm like, okay, great. Nice work. We got, we got ROSC. We're stabilizing her. Then 30 minutes later, she goes into PA, PA arrest. So, and the lab started coming back at that time. So she was pretty acidotic, um, very sick. Her, she, her sodium was very low as well. And I talked to the cardiologist again. And do you guys know what TNKA is? So it's it's a it's a it's a clot buster. It's ten ectoplase. It's known as or a tissue plasminogen activator. It essentially activates the body. It it it's basically I would say it's a clot buster and it acts by activating part of the body's clotting cascade to uh, reverse the clotting. So um, after that. Uh, she did get ROSC after we gave her teen. So there's something going on there. I mean, if you give, so we have that kind of EKG, you know, it means STEMI, it, it, I think it met STEMI criteria. It was like one of those borderline cases where this could be, if it was a pa alive, awake patient, stable, it would have been taken to the cath lab. Um, but the reason why I think the STEMI alert was not, it, you know, she didn't, her, she didn't meet STEMI criteria in the field, but then here in the ER, she did have uh, ST elevations. But when somebody's too unstable like that, you got to look at other options, and our protocol is to give the clot buster. So, anyhow, you guys know the outcome. She did not do well, unfortunately, um, died. So, anyhow, any questions about that case? Anything that, anything that would have been done differently in the field? Do you think? What, what, so, if you guys have that kind of patient in the field, um, who would have intubated her in the field? Anybody would have intubated her in the field? Yeah. Did you say? I, I know it's part of the. I mean, I know you guys have protocol, but uh, and I guess this kind of patient can decline pretty quickly too. So the the mental state. I mean, this actually isn't a criticism of the paramedics. Or I think uh, it's hard. It's hard, especially if you're you know in the, in the transport time. They may be alert, you know, alert, awake, and then all of a sudden, like you're getting them out of the ambulance, and you're like, oh shoot, now she's not really. She's very confused. That oxygen saturation reading that I got with it was in the low 80s. Was that real? Was that fake? Was she just not perfusing well, so not getting a good pleth? But uh, anyways, any questions about that case? The reason I wanted to give that case is that she's complaining of back pain and abdominal pain. So she died before we got her to the CD scanner, so I don't know if she had a dissection. Um, it could have been a dissection, you know, going like we're talking about, going into the the coronary arteries up near the top of the aorta, right in the chest. Um, you know, there could, it could have just put a plain old ST elevation MI. But the worst thing, I, mean, she, I thought the interesting thing was she was tell, she was complaining about all her belly pain. 
you know, I'm not sure. Go ahead. What was that? Her troponin, I think, actually was in the it was not terribly elevated. I think it was in the hundreds. I didn't include that here, but I think it was like 140. So it's not like you know, if somebody's having like a troponin of 2,000, then that's you know, that's pretty obvious. But 140, I would say that's that's definitely a sign that there's cardiac damage. But then we were doing CPR and. You know, usually somebody will leak a little bit of troponins into their blood if we're doing CPR for an hour on them. So I'm not sure, you know, what exactly was the cause of her death, but I thought that was an interesting case. Um, you know, when she was awake, she was able to tell she's having back pain and abdominal pain. So something to think about. Somebody's complaining of that and has and is hypoxic and is looking really sick. That's uh, that's a bad a bad situation. Anyhow. So, any question? Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, this wouldn't cause hypoxia, but I don't know if you guys have ever seen this in terms of ischemia. <clears throat> it sounds like that sort of presents like that. These people that are like writhing around in pain, right? And like really, the only people that like make it to the ER that are talking that I've seen die, other than like VFRS from STEMI, are like one of the big ones because there's women there ischemia, and they're like sick as hell. They look modeled like the picture Dave showed. And they're just like, they're writhing in pain. They'll be sitting on the stretcher, they can't get comfortable, and then they die. And um, uh, it's a clot that's in the superior mesenteric artery, which comes off the aorta, and it gives blood to the gut. And uh, so the gut becomes necrotic and ischemic, and they just die. And um, I mean, I've seen like a couple of people like that are walking in, and they walk in and come and talking to you, and they're like just in a lot of pain, and then they die. It's, Unless you find it, you know, if you, if, unless you find it um, and get him to the operating room to get the clot out, there's nothing you can do. Um, but they, they're really sick and scary. But uh, maybe that's what this was. But I don't know why she would be on oxygen. So just to repeat for people who are not here, uh, Dr. Frank was saying that people with mesenteric ischemia can be uh, alert, talking, complaining of abdominal pain, back pain, but then all of a sudden decompensate really quickly. And um, anyway, it's pain out of proportion to the exam, but they look kind of, they look pretty modeled. And just to refresh, like mesenteric ischemia is due to a clot in the superior mesenteric artery, and the superior mesenteric artery is you can see it here. It's not very big, but uh, actually, I think that's right. This is the superior mesenteric artery right here. This is the inferior mesenteric artery. So now, unfortunately, it's hard to not. It's hard to have all the layers of the abdomen and include pictures of these two arteries, but so superior and inferior. This is the celiac trunk. This supplies blood to the stomach, which should be up here, and the liver, which is up here, and the spleen, which is back here. The superior mesenteric artery supplies blood to the mesentery. It supplies blood to, it sends blood vessels off to uh, most of the colon and a lot of the small bowel. So as you guys can see, if somebody's and if somebody's bowel is infarcted, I mean, it's essentially the same kind of, it's like a, you know, it's like an MI of the abdomen, essentially. So it can be really bad pain. And I, I, I'm not sure I, I've ever seen, in my limited experience, I haven't seen mesenteric ischemia yet or diagnosed it. But, you know, I'm sure once I'm doing it for longer, and Dr. Frank's uh, seen a bunch, but as he's saying, these people can be alert talking to you, and then, you know, they can, essentially, as they infarct more and more of their bowel, they're going to be altered. They're going to be shocky. They're going to look. They're going to be looking like this. I get the picture. I mean, that's just not a good. And and you know maybe maybe this bruising right here. Maybe maybe it was. You know, maybe it was a leaking abdominal. I, I don't. I, I didn't really think that at the time. But you know that could. You know if, if maybe there was more bruising on the belly. I, I maybe would have thought about. Uh, you know the uh, colon sign. Or you have the bruising around the umbilicus, but you know I, either way the management still would have been the same. So like I think one of you guys asked the question, well, what do we do for aortic dissection? Is people that are bleeding in their abdomen or have an infarct abdomen, you know, this is might be how they present. They might present coding eventually or part of the transport if they have if they have uh, that much time to live and if they have more time they code with us or on the floor or in the OR. So. Um, say, uh, yeah, I'd still think about these cases. I, I, there's a lot, every time, so, yeah, it's just, probably, probably seen a lot of death, but uh, unfortunately that's what it is in this line of business. You'll see people die and 
you know, I, I guess I always think about trying to give them enough time so that they can see their loved ones either in the ER one last time or, or have a moment to repair before they meet their maker. But anyhow, you guys have any other questions or? Yes, sir. That's something um, when the patient was desatting or even with, when you were coding her, if you put an ultrasound on her, would you be able to see anything or do you need a deeper image? No, that's a good question. So the question was, if we were while we're coding her, would we have been able to slap an, or put an ultrasound probe and see the aorta? See, the, you know, the, the ultrasound doesn't do a good job of, that's a great question because that's exactly, so unstable patient in the ER, maybe eventually you guys will have ultrasound in the field. I, I have a feeling that probably will happen someday. Um, at some point, but. Even, <laughs> it's an October thing too. Um, I would say that it's difficult even if you have somebody that's coding and that has a, I guess is girthy or has a lot of uh, extra tissue is big, obese, I said it. Um, it's hard to see the, it's hard to see the aorta and it's harder to do that while coding. But I did put the ultrasound probe on the patient and I did look at the heart to make sure that there was not a giant uh, pericardial effusion. A pericardial effusion is, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with some of it, but for those of you who aren't, pericardial effusion is fluid around the heart. There's a sac that encompasses the heart. It's kind of like the, you know, there's, there's a lot of sacs and sheaths in the body and that's the sheath around the heart. So between the heart and the muscle, there's a sheath and fluid can get in there. And I want to make sure that, in, that that wasn't going on, but uh, there was no fluid around the heart, uh, but I did not get a good view of the aorta. Um, I'm not sure now that if you ask, I don't remember if I did, I should have. Um, but uh, I've tried it before in patients that look like this and are coding and it's just it's like looking at a it's like trying to see out the window in a snowstorm in Minnesota in in February and there's uh, you know with cars in front of you I, I, you know, I couldn't see it I, you know but uh, I, I should have but even then I'm not sure I don't know hopefully you know you ho have to hope that it would change management and the patient would make it to the surgical floor but in that case, if they're coding and they look like that, you know, I'm not sure if the surgeon surgeon should take them, but uh, or maybe maybe should is a strong word, but they maybe it's indicated to go to surgery, but they might. You said it was a, your son that was. Yeah, he's fine now. He had, yeah, so he had it, it, it was misdiagnosed. Intussusception was diagnosed with SMH, and you know, obviously that's an emergency, but. Um, is there a way to diagnose that clinically or to help kind of lead you to greater suspicion? You know, I, so there's a couple things there. When, you know, when a child, I didn't really talk about children much in the presentation directly, but in this exception, classically, they can have, this is, and I, I've never seen this, but if it's bad, they have current jelly stool. Current jelly stool, it could be pretty dramatic. You know, obviously the parents can be like, they have red blood in their stool. I haven't seen that yet, but once it gets to that point, that's a really bad sign. That means that the bowel has infarcted. And, and intussusception, just to talk about it briefly, is like a telescope that kind of goes back and forth in itself. When the bowel, when either a small bowel telescopes, or the small the small bowel telescopes into the large bowel, or the small bowel telescopes on the small small bowel, and cuts off blood supply. So it's kind of like it's a, you know. Pathologically, it's not the exact same thing as mesenteric ischemia, but it's going to be pretty painful. And children will have episodes where they almost as if they lose consciousness for a minute, they're not really responsive. They become almost a ton for, it can be for a few seconds, and then they'll come to, they may be writhing, holding their belly in pain. And sometimes you can feel, classically, there's like a sausage shaped mass in their abdomen. So those two things, like a you know, episodes, intermittent colicky abdominal pain, sausage-shaped mass in the abdomen, and current jelly stools. But I think if, personally, because I've seen it a couple times, I, saw, I did a, I spent a month at All Children's um, in the ER there, and I saw that there were a bunch of transfers, we got transfers, so like, now I have a heightened suspicion for it, maybe I've missed it in the past, but I think you have to have a heightened level of suspicion for that in children because it's a, the age range I think is anywhere from like one to three years old is the most common age for that to happen. How old was your son? He was just about one year 
one year old. Yeah, so that's when I've seen it. So one to three years old when that happens. So yeah, appendicitis, that'd be really early for appendicitis. I mean, I'm sure it's happened, but uh, so, you know, if a child has belly pain, like, you know, that's been bad, it's colicky, meaning it's coming and going. In a one to three year old, I would think about intussusception in that case, or I should, if it's a good day. So, but hopefully I don't misdiagnose it, but. Uh, just as a follow-up, yeah. I, just, I just emailed it to you, but um, there is an episode, episode, I think it's episode 12 of Real Emergency with Dr. Antetti. He speaks specifically on that. It's three different pediatric cases, but he speaks specifically, they follow a case on that. So it's worth watching if anyone's interested in following up on it after this. It's worth watching that because they go a little bit more in depth with the pediatric cases. So just to repeat for people who aren't here, I guess Nikki is saying that she has a good uh, resource with Dr. Ann Tevy, uh, who talks about some pediatric cases uh, that would be helpful. There's a question. Okay. Steve. Can you go back to the bottom lines? Yeah, yeah. Case that we have in. Sorry, I have that. Uh, let's see here. So these are the these are the vital signs. Looking back at the EMS report, these are the vital signs from the EMS uh, report. Shock index on that. That's a good point. That's, and in that case, I think, I, and this isn't, you know, it's easy for me to Monday morning quarterback, and this is not a criticism, this is more just one thing that I would think about. I, I, and tell me if I'm wrong, but in this case, if the patient has these vitals and it's hard to get IV access, I would get an IO and give them pain medication. Not for just pain medication, they do that. Right, right. No, no. I, I, say, I would say if you can't get an IV in there, they look like this. They need, they're going to need, um, I would, I, you know, yeah, not to just do pain medication. Yeah, no. No, I'm saying, like, it, I know the IO is going to hurt still, but I, sorry, the combination of words there was, even if the interosseous line is not, um, you know, they're not hypotensive, but if they look like they're in shock and you can't get an IV for 10, 15 minutes, or you don't anticipate being able to do that, I, or I at least think about it, you know, think about it and, you know, I know it's it maybe not necessarily part of the protocol, but uh, any qu any thoughts about that? Would anybody do? I'm not sure actually. If I, I would, you know, I mean, we have ultrasound in the ER, so I would just put an ultrasound in. But they could do it to justify the RSI with the SATs, but we're not we don't really IO people to give. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Yeah, I guess risk benefit, but. Uh, Yeah, so I guess they, I guess the discussion would be uh, patients aren't hypotensive, so fluids aren't indicated. Um, but if you're going to, and I think at this point, but that's my kind of, that's why I bring it up, is not for pain medication, it'd be for RSI medications or, or ACLS medications um, in this situation. Well, I think at least we'd think about it, maybe not everybody would do it. Of course, in the end, it's disc like discretion. But I think, I think in this case, it, you know, where you're thinking about the next thing is going to be she's altered or getting altered. The next step would be intubation. You need to get set up for that. Help yourself out one step ahead. And um, you know, if, even if it does cause the patient pain, it may save her life, you can always give her some analgesia after, you know, afterwards. And, I, and again, I think, I think this is a, a good question. Don't, don't be afraid about masking the pain. You know, I think I've had that same fear myself. You know, am I gonna, if I, I, I don't think about it as much anymore, but early on I, I did, you know, I was just gonna, affect the patient's diagnosis, um, but, you know, I, it's better for the patient. I think they can think more clearly, they can help you out, they can help tell you the history better, they will feel better, um, you know, their stress level will be down. I mean, physiologically, I think they'll do better if their pain is somewhat under control. You know, some cases, the hypotension might make things worse, but, uh, you know, you can always give them some fluids. So, don't be afraid to give pain medication. Any other questions? Thanks so much for uh, yeah, listening, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.